The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. 360 Energy is a North American leader in energy and carbon reduction. Recently, we have launched the 360 Carbon Excellence Program, designed to make corporate climate change actions more effective and successful. For more information, check the link in our podcast description. On today's episode, we welcome guest Alan Fogwell. Alan Fogwell joined the Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada, PTAC, in October 2021 as their Chief Operating Officer. He is an energy sector executive with over 30 years of experience in both the public and private sector. Mr. Fogwell's background has focused on economic, technological, and market analysis of energy sector issues, along with energy policy development related to climate change, regulation, and demand issues. Mr. Fogwell has previously worked with the Canadian Energy Research Institute for seven years as president and CEO. He has also served as a chair and CEO of the Canadian Energy Efficiency Alliance and the Canadian Gas Research Institute. Mr. Fogwell is a 15-year veteran of the Canadian Forces in the Signal Corps. Now let's get into the episode with Alan. Welcome back, Dave and John. Good to be Thank back. Thank you, Sandra. Nice to be back. And we're welcoming back our guest, Alan Fogwell from the Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada. Welcome back, Alan. Thank you. And John, you're kicking off this episode today. So today we're yes. talking about the future of the oil industry in Canada. I'm actually very curious about this episode. I think being part of the newer generation in the energy industry, a lot of times we're almost advised to stay out of the oil industry because you know, it's going to end soon or there won't be jobs for that. And I think this episode will prove that wrong. When we last met and talked, you shared with us a lot of interesting information about what the industry is doing with regard to methane em- emissions. And I think you know, you touched on the point. I mean, it's about 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than, than carbon dioxide. So, you know, there's a big thing to be done there. But I wonder if you could share with us and our listeners what the industry's doing about carbon emissions as such? Sure. Oftentimes they're they're done in conjunction, but of course, some of the things that the sector is working on cross both conventional and unconventional. When I talk about unconventional, I primarily mean oil sands, is energy efficiency. So making your processes more efficient and they're continuing to do that. And as I mentioned in the, the, the previous podcast, we're looking at uh, one to one and a half percent Uh, decline in emissions intensity per barrel of oil per year. Now, when you get growth in those activities, uh, increased production, that ultimately does mean increased emissions. But the sector has been and continues to be laser focused on reducing those emissions through energy efficiency. And if we look at the two different markets, the conventional versus unconventional, the conventional market, we are a much better situation in terms of emissions per barrel, better than the average globally. And in terms of the oil sands, we're, those are unique to Canada. There's a couple other areas in the world that have them, but we're the only ones that are really developing them in any major way. And of course, that's that's due to the investment and in, in vision from the federal government in, from the 1970s. People tend to forget that. But in that sector, we're looking at moving away from direct thermal applications for extracting the oil. And the two major ones that people are looking at is using electricity, like electricity probes to heat up the oil instead of steam, and also in place of steam using solvents. So some lighter oils or or liquids, I should say, like uh, ethane, propane, and butane, to go down there and dissolve it without having to use steam. So those three areas, energy efficiency, of using alternative approaches to mobilizing the oil underground, and also the greening of the Western electricity grid, which provides a lot of power, are all ways that the sector is reducing its emissions and and it's continuing to do that. Yes, thank you for that. I think just in for clarification, I said methane and then carbon. And of course, methane is, is has got carbon in it, but we're talking more about the broader carbon dioxide, broader emissions. The other thing 
I suppose I would like to to ask you about is we had COP26 in Glasgow. It was a question of whether it was going to happen or not. And I'm guessing from what I saw that there were representatives of the oil industry present there as participants. But will COP26 have an impact on the oil industry going forward, I suppose, is, is, the, is the question. My answer is no. And the reason is, is because the oil sector was already there. The oil sector has been investing millions of dollars in clean tech for decades. Right. And, and so COP26 is, is much more about those laggard if you will, countries that haven't been taking this issue seriously. In Canada, we have been. And in addition to that, not only is the industry showing leadership, but governments are showing leadership at the provincial level as well in terms of new regulations around environmental footprints, including CO2. We're well ahead of, of most other countries in terms of our plans and activities. And uh, it's unfortunate that the, that perspective is not better represented in, in, our, in our media today. As I've mentioned before, the sector is highly committed to doing this work. They've taken leadership roles in a lot of activities, including you know, Generation Energy, that was an initiative by the federal government a few years ago, and the development of a huge funding mechanism called CRIN, Clean Resources Innovation Network. That was all the genesis of the sector to get more money into the sector to do this clean tech stuff because it can be expensive at the outset. And in order to get this done properly, we need to work as collaboratives as a sector because we all have the same issue. So no, COP26 didn't make any changes for oil and gas sector in Canada. We, they, we've been a leader or they've been a leader. That sector has been a leader for, for many, many years. One thing that does help but not necessarily the, the energy sector per se, is the advancement of the international trading framework, Article 6. And that is very important, uh, especially for developed countries, to help manage the costs of the work we need to do. Being able to look at other jurisdictions and trade credits using blockchain technology, which wasn't around when mm. the Kyoto protocol came out and the, the clean development mechanism was put in place. The reason why that failed was because there wasn't enough certification of the reductions. Now blockchain can provide that. So that's the big thing that came out of COP26, not the motivation needed for the energy sector in Canada to move forward. They've already got that. Can I throw in an additional? And it's it struck me because we've been talking about this, you know, painting the oil industry uh, as, as a bad actor. And we know, I guess North America is the same as, as Europe. There are a lot of pressure groups are talking about organized institutional investors should remove their money from the oil and gas industry. And I thought there was an interesting comment and I can't remember who it was. But somebody said one of the solutions would be for oil companies to actually split their businesses so that they've got one business, which is just old style oil extraction. And then they've got the other business, which is dealing with, you know, the, the opportunities and everything else that it would be so that investors would feel happy to invest in that part of the business rather than, you know, the oil in the ground, you know, this campaign of keep the oil in the ground. I wonder what your view is on that. <laughs> How much time do <laughs> <you> have? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you know, if you're looking at companies as entities and they're there primarily to generate a return for their shareholders, if the shareholder wants to make the change, that's their money. So that's the way I would look at it. So, but what's interesting about that is the idea that the oil companies are some sort of nebulous organization off to the side is not true, right? It's made up of, you know, our friends and family. It's made up of our sons and daughters. It's made up of a whole bunch of people. And, you know, as generations progress through these companies, people bring in those different perspectives. You know, so we've got younger generations that have got a heightened sense of importance of environmental sustainability. That's great. Let's build it into the process. The key, though, is uh, leaving it in the ground is just not a realistic option. 
anyone, anyone who looks at the need for energy on this planet will know for sure that we're still going to need a, a significant chunk of what's being produced now for the foreseeable future. Right. So when people talk about net zero by 2050, that's not no oil. That's yeah, no net emissions. Right? Net zero. It's yeah. not zero oil. It's net zero, not zero. And you know, if you look at two, let's say, highly regarded institutions globally, the U.S. Energy Information Administration and the International Energy Association, I think that's what it's called. And uh, both those organizations have put out scenario analysis related to hitting the Paris goals of 1.5% or two or two and a half, what have you. In all those scenarios, we're still producing 50 to 70 million barrels of oil a day. So right. the industry is still going to be there. The industry is so still going to be there. So how, and going back to what I said in the earlier podcast, four elements to the solution. Electrify where you can, reduce oil and gas emissions as much as possible, carbon capture utilization and storage, and manage the cost through the international trading framework. Okay. Oil and gas are going to be here for long past when I'm, dead and gone yeah a solution thank you alan. alan the the way you just described and maybe you already maybe you've answered the question just on what you just said but what are the major changes that are happening in the canadian oil and gas industry if you haven't discussed it already well i guess one of the other elements that the the sector is looking at is esg reporting so environmental social and and governance reporting in terms of investment attraction there's a, a lot of activity that's happening in, in that area. And if you look at what's covered under the ESG framework, it is uh, very closely linked to the UN sustainability goals. Now, of course, emissions are an important goal, but it's not the only one. You know, energy poverty, gender balance, equitable treatment, all those different things, biodiversity, anti corruption democracy, all those things are part of the UN sustainability goals and influence ESG. The challenge we have right now is twofold with respect to that. One is when people are looking at ESG, the principal parameter they focus on are carbon emissions or carbon equivalent emissions. So the other elements about energy poverty, corruption, you know, social justice, those things, they may be part of the reporting, but they're not part of the decision making. So that's one thing. The other thing is we still don't have a common framework for how companies are evaluated by third parties. And just focusing on the oil and gas sector, you have some of these frameworks where they will compare a upstream oil producer with a downstream natural gas distributor because they're all in the energy sector. But yet they have completely different business models, completely different impacts on society, completely different impacts on our environment because they do different things. And yet what we're finding is everyone's lumped together. And so if you're comparing, you know, a upstream oil company with a downstream natural gas distributor, of course you're not going to compare, right? And we have a lack of standardization in terms of our frameworks, and we have a lack of a good quality analysis associated with these third-party organizations that are trying to rank different companies within what they consider a broad sector envelope. Now, it doesn't only apply to oil and gas, but that's the only one I'm familiar with, and it's likely to be similar to other sectors where you have analysts coming in with very little knowledge about the sector itself and making these significant assessments that are on the face of it misleading. Mm, interesting. Now, this is actually a perfect question based on the work that you're doing now. So I'm going to ask you to put on your future lens. In the next 10 years, describe to us how or what you think the oil and gas industry is going to look like in 10 years' time. What, what would it look like, Alan, from your view? A couple of things I think that are in the cards. Actually, I'll, I'll mention three things. One is, of course, the reduction in emissions. The, the, the sector, at least in Canada, has been investing a lot in reducing emissions. And, you know, our organization, Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada, 
is is dedicated to developing new clean tech technologies as well as business processes to reduce the impact. In addition to that, of course, there's a lot of work being done on other areas with respect to biodiversity, reclamation, closing sites properly, water management. So that's one. The second is I see that there is going to be a uptick in carbon capture utilization and storage. It, it is a fundamental solution that we need to have in place. And I stress the utilization part primarily because we have to be in a situation where we're doing something with the, the carbon that we're capturing. Thankfully, there are a couple of straightforward, not necessarily easy, but straightforward solutions. One is uh, injecting it into cement, and that cement is stronger and lighter and more durable than the way we, we build cement and concrete buildings today. And the other is in terms of carbon fiber, which we're already seeing in the airline industry. It's still relatively expensive, but it can be another building product. So instead of plastics for your car, it's carbon fiber, for example. Right. So that's that's the second area. And the third is a an increase in Canadian export of clean technologies. We've got a significant asset and resource in terms of the people and solutions that are being developed right now and over the last little while and into the future to deal with all these issues, carbon emissions, methane emissions, uh, species at risk water quality, a reclamation. We are much farther ahead than most other jurisdictions. And we can sell that those services and products so that our oil and gas sector becomes more than just the commodity play. It becomes a commodity plus services and products. And if you think about it, if from a commodity point of view, we're about what four million barrels a day and the, the global economy is about 100 million barrels a day, so a small part of that. But if we were to sell our products and services to the rest of the world, because we're ahead of them in a lot of these areas, we're not talking about you know, a market that's just Canada, which is 4 million. We're talking about a market that's 30 times Canada, and we have the opportunity to be first. Mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting. And for our listeners, Alan and I have, as I suggested earlier in our first podcast, we, we have a history of working together on different things. I think, and John would be able to speak about this, there's a lot of things that we do in Canada that most people aren't aware of that we we could market and we could do a much. So I think, I think we got a great opportunity as the world advances for sure. It comes back to your Canadian modesty, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And you know we 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 need more people in the sector to help the sector evolve and and achieve its opportunities. We need engineers, we need economists, we need you know skilled uh, electricians, we need welders, we need iron workers, we need we need everyone. And so you know the big challenge associated with achieving these three major goals over the next 10 years is we need people. And that's interesting given the, the concept that some young people are, should we say, being scared off of going into oil and gas because it doesn't have a future. Yeah, and, yeah. and I will categorically disagree with that statement because there is no credible assessment that I've ever seen that <clears throat> said that we are going to be without oil and gas as a major part of our energy system for the foreseeable future. And when I say foreseeable future, I'm not talking 2050, I'm talking 2070, 2080, 2090, yeah. long, long after I've passed away. So it's just not going to happen. So if we get to the point where we accept that fact and have a more mature discussion, we go back to my four points, which is electrify where you can, make it as, as efficient as possible, carbon capture utilization and storage, and the, and the trading framework to keep the costs down. Yeah. 
A bit of a personal question that I would like to throw around the table. What are you most excited about for the future of the oil industry? So for me, I hope there will be an increase in education for general public. I think oftentimes, you know, when you see a new pipeline's being built, everyone's angry about it. Well, why are you angry about it? Let's let's actually educate ourselves before we comment on these news items. So I really hope that the oil industry does a better job at educating the general population. And the public is going to listen. Yes. Versus yeah. No, well, as you've, got to have people, you've got to have people listening. I mean, Alan touched on it before about the the, the vaccination issue, and it, it it is quite incredible. Like I think Alan said, you know, not a medical professional, but everything you read about it says, yeah, there's a little bit of risk, but overall, it, it's worth it. But we've, we're seeing, and it's around the world, isn't it? We're seeing people who are rallying against it. They, they don't have the foundation of fact. And I, I think, what was it somebody said, you know, about a lie getting around the world before the truth got out of bed? And I, I think there is, there is this problem in, in communication and also in people hearing what they want to hear. You know, I thought a lot about this issue, and I think the the very first thing you have to have is trust. Yeah, uh, you have to have trust in um, your politicians. You have to have trust in the process, and you have to have, you know, trust in the organizations that are doing the work. In this case, oil and gas companies. And as I said before, oil and gas companies are not these nebulous organizations off to the side. There are friends and family. There are mm -hmm. sons and daughters, there are neighbors. So thinking about it as a separate off to the side kind of organization already diminishes the, the trust that you can have in people. If you don't have that trust, there's no point in going forward. How do you get trust? You get to know people, you get to understand their values. So educating them, educating the general public in terms of, of you know, the, how the system works, what we need to do, how far we can go, what are the realistic outcomes, giving them the facts is not is not the, the first step. First step is, you know, recognizing that they've got different values and trying to come to a common understanding about what the values are, understanding what their predetermined biases are. Not saying that people are wrong having biases, they're just people, right? We're all flawed. If we don't have trust, we don't have anything. And we've seen time and again where facts go out and they run smack up against value and emotion. Value and emotion wins all the time. Yeah. There's a reason why people use the term hearts and minds, right? Hearts first, minds second. Very true. Alan, to conclude this episode, what is the biggest takeaway for our listeners? The biggest takeaway, I think, is that there is a there is a long-term future for oil and gas in Canada in terms of both uh, economic benefits for the country, as well as providing leadership to the rest of the world in the oil and gas sector in terms of new technologies and new processes to make them, everyone else, as clean and as uh, cost-effective and as efficient as Canada. And, you know, our oil and gas sector is going to grow, if not from a commodity perspective, then from a service and uh, product, uh, clean tech products perspective. So as I mentioned before, the sector is looking for people to come join and help create that future. Thanks for that, Alan. Any final comments, Dave and John? I, I hope uh, our listeners listening to this podcast uh, and the two that Alan's actually I, I I really hope they do listen to everything because I think the material that was covered should inform a lot of people of issues that they may not be aware of and I I, I think it may give people a different impression of what's happening why it's happening and and the impact of the oil and gas industry going forward so I'm really grateful, Alan, that you spent the time with us to go through this because of some of the material. And I actually, by the way, I, I say it to almost every podcast. I've learned so much, but I appreciate you uh, going through the oil and gas information because I think there is a lot of perception of that is incorrect. And I, 
think you shared uh, some really good points. So thank you for that. Well, you're most welcome. And anytime I'm always interested in talking about this, I think it's vitally important that we try and get it right. We're going to make mistakes, of course. But if we have a mature debate, we all listen and we come to some sort of general consensus, that will be much better for us as, as a country going forward. John, with your international bent, well, what, I, what do I, you see? I, I, I joked about your Canadian modesty, but it, it is a point there that you, 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 you are known not necessarily for, for shouting what you do from the treetops. And I think that's a, a valid point. I often think that, that, again, this binary thing we were talking about, you know, like people say, oh, Amer you know, the US, USA is terrible in environmental issues but you can find places in it that are exceptional and world leading and i think you've you've got that there but i think the thing that struck me at the end of our last podcast was we were talking about the importance of being better informed but what's really made me think from this one is your your comment about trust and it's it's one of those things the minute you said it i thought that's blindingly obvious but <laughs> But never really sort of, although I had to hold back a little bit, because when you sort of talked about having trust in politicians, I thought, depends where you are, but that could be a big problem. And a um, long conversation. Yeah, long conversation. Are, trust, trust in all of these things. And a, a silly point here. One of the things that we do as a company, we have a newsletter that we call the trusted advisor. <laughs> and, you know, so we, we do value trust, but we should perhaps think about it a little bit more. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, what it always boils down to is we're all people. We all have different values. We all have different perspectives, different knowledge, and we're all stuck with each other. So we got to get along. We are. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to think about the other option. <laughs> yeah. Alan, Dave, John, thank you for your time today. It's been really good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching The 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts. See you next week.